Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Chelsea Larson, the Crocker Art Museum's Director of Development, and I will be your MC today. I am so happy to have you here with us as we take a closer look at the exhibition Country, City, and Sea with Dr. William Brazil and Marianne Bacus. And before we get started, I first want to share our land acknowledgement. Um, we acknowledge that the Crocker Art Museum is on the traditional land of the Nisenan people and California is the homeland to many tribes. And we are very honored to be here today. And so as we begin today's program, I would like to encourage you all to use the chat feature to communicate with us and to each other. And we will have a live Q&A after the talk. So please submit any questions that you have for Dr. Brazil or Marianne, and we will try to get through as many together today as we can. And today's program is being recorded. So if you have to leave early or you know a fellow member who couldn't join us today, we will be sending out a recording of the program later next week, and that will also have closed captioning available. And so with that, let's begin the program. And I would like to introduce you to our very own Lyle Jones, Morton Marcy Friedman, Director and CEO. Hi, Lyle. Thank you, Chelsea. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone at home to this special look at our latest exhibition, Country, City, and Sea, Dutch Romantic and Hague School Paintings from the Bacus Gift. Now, last January, I could not have fathomed that today we'd be live streaming our member exhibition preview online. And although I'm saddened that you are seeing these artworks for the first time from the comfort of your own home, I look forward to your seeing these incredible works in person when the museum is allowed to reopen to the public. I'm asked every day when I think that reopening will be, and even though I don't have that answer, I hope it'll be soon, because I miss seeing you in the galleries as you experience the joy and wonder of viewing works of art or a new exhibition for the first time. And I look forward to sharing these beautiful Dutch paintings with you. I want to extend my deep gratitude to Marianne Bacus and her late husband Jan for their generous donation of Dutch paintings from which this exhibition is drawn. The Bacus Collection has helped establish the Crocker as a rich center for the study of 19th century Dutch painting and art, and I want to express my appreciation. I also want to thank you, our members, for your continued support of the Crocker Art Museum. At this time, when so many of us are struggling, your commitment to the museum and your dedication to helping us provide art and art access for everyone in our community is greatly appreciated. You know, together, we can transform lives through the power of art. And for that, I thank you. We have an exciting program scheduled for you today, so grab your Abbey cocktail and sit back for a closer look at this beautiful show and a lively discussion on 19th century Dutch paintings between Crocker curator Dr. William Brazil and collector Marianne Bacus. Enjoy. Thank you, Lyle. It is now my great honor to welcome the exhibition's curator, Dr. William Brazil. Trained at the National Gallery of Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Dr. Brazil is the organizer of many exhibitions, including a recent exhibition, The Splendor of Germany, 18th Century Drawings for the Crocker Art Museum. With a PhD from the University of Maryland and a dissertation on Italian sketchbooks, he is the author of many articles for master drawings, including Old Masters in Old California, the origins of the drawings collection at the Crocker Art Museum. And in addition to coordinating major exhibition catalogs, uh, Dr. Brazil has organized exhibitions on Italian paintings and European and American prints for the Crocker, as well as served as coordinating curator for many loan exhibitions hosted at the museum, including 2015's The Age of Albrecht Durer, German drawings from the Ecole des Beaux-Arts of Paris. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. William Brazil as he shares a little bit more about country, city, and sea. Hi, William. Thank you for that kind introduction, Chelsea. Um, it's been a pleasure to put together the show, especially given the wealth of fascinating material to choose from. The story of the Dutch Romantics in the Hague School is an absorbing one, and I've been lucky to have had the chance to learn more about the period and the culture that these paintings reflect. We'll be learning more about the formation of the collection with Marianne Bacus later, but first we have a video to introduce you to the, uh, to the exhibition itself. 
which we hope, again, you'll be able to see in person soon. Welcome to Country City and Sea, Dutch Romantic and Hague School paintings from the Baker's Gift. So between 1850 and, a, and the First World War, around 1850 um, and the First World War, paintings by the Dutch Romantics and the Hague School were some of the most sought after on both sides of the Atlantic. So to give you an idea, artists uh, uh, traveled back and forth um, between the United States and the Netherlands. Um, there was a market in New York uh, with many dealers, um, and in fact, the founding collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art included uh, Dutch Romantic and Hague School paintings. After an eclipse in the mid-20th century, um, the paintings by 19th century Dutch artists um, have become much more important, especially in the past 30 years. There's a great resurgence in interest um, in the market, et cetera. Um, so it's our hope that this exhibition, um, which, of course, one of its goals is to reintroduce this material to the American public in a systematic way, um, will have the result of also increasing interest, uh, both by the public, of course, but also by scholars. Born to a Dutch family in South Africa, the late Jan Bekes um, grew up in a household devoted to travel, music, and art. Um, and one of the things in this household um, was a small collection of 19th century paintings, which, among other things, um, piqued the young man's interest. Um, he then trained, uh, when choosing a profession, um, he trained for medicine in uh, Pretoria, South Africa, and then came to the United States. Um, in the United States, uh, he became uh, chairman, eventually, of the Department of Otolaryngology at Wayne State University in Michigan. Uh, as he uh, had the means, um, then he pursued his interest in art, um, including Asian, pre-Columbian, uh, African art, um, and then eventually decided to narrow to the 19th century Dutch paintings that had uh, been such a childhood interest. Um, so the collection of over 250 paintings was built by Jan and his wife, now widow, um, Marianne Bacus. Dutch Romanticism differs from the sort of wider European Romanticism um, in several ways. When one thinks about European Romanticism, you think often about, in Germany, for example, um, mountain landscapes that show man's helplessness in the fa face of nature, or in Britain, Turner's seascapes that are as much about the paint as they are about the sea, or in France, theatrical scenes um, of an, to them, exotic Middle East. Um, all of those are uh, directed towards evoking a specific emotion on the part of the viewer. Um, so whether that's terror or pity or some kind of drama. Um, Dutch Romanticism actually is also devoted to evoking emotions on the part of the viewer, um, but the emotions are a bit different. Um, here, um, it's nostalgia for agrarian life or the comforts of village or town, and even a bit of that sort of tension between man and the sea that sort of is really part of the culture of a country that's based on, of course, um, a major part of it on merchant shipping. Visually, there are several things to keep in mind in Dutch Romanticism. Um, the first one is that the hand of the artist 
isn't terribly evident. That is, the paint does not sort of it have, have a great physicality. So we're sort of erasing the craft that goes into the painting. Um, a second thing, of course, is you know, that appeal to uh, emotion, um, and as I've said, more restrained emotion. Um, but the third thing is that to achieve that emotion, Dutch Romantic artists didn't hesitate to change, manipulate, combine elements in various scenes, whether that's in the country moving uh, trees around or creating cliffs or something like that. Later in the century than the Dutch Romantics are the artists of the Hague School. Um, the Hague School began um, because of a group of artists who visited um, a group of French artists in the forest of Fontainebleau or uh, in the uh, village of Barbizon uh, near the forest of Fontainebleau. So artists like Jean-Francois Daubigny or Théodore Rousseau are the people that these Dutch artists visited. Um, so those, are, those French artists were known as the Barbizon School and you can't really say that the Dutch artists imported the Barbizon school to the Netherlands. Um, because really, um, they, there are just some visual things, mainly. Um, one of them is the physicality of the paint. That is brushwork that um, sort of sits on the surface of the painting in such a way that you sort of experience it as a separate thing. Um, which is, of course, very different from the Dutch Romantics sort of erasing the hand of the artist. So there's that. Then also um, realism. Um, and that is depicting what is in front of them. Now, the Hague School, um, by the time they're visiting the Barbizon artists, really, and certainly by the time that the Hague School um, really sort of becomes that, becomes the Hague School in the 1870s, photography is very much a part of people's lives. So the idea of composing things, choosing different elements um, to create a pleasing view is much less important. And you start seeing things uh, that you see in photography like things implied outside the picture frame, or cropping in an unusual manner, that kind of thing. So, and of course, they're also going out into nature to paint these scenes, or of course, to the town or to the sea. Um, now, the third thing um, that the Hague School artists uh, tend towards is a restricted palette. That is, they tend towards grays, browns, muted greens, as here, um, muted blues for scenes of the sea and sky. Um, that is uh, you know, a stylistic choice that they make. And of course, perhaps they were being more honest about the Dutch climate. Um, but in any case, um, this tonalism is very much part of what the Hague School artists um, do um, in terms of uh, technique. The video you have just watched is taken from an hour-long version that gives a more in-depth look at the show. The longer version will be up on the Crocker website soon, so keep an eye out for it. Um, now I'd like to introduce Marianne Bacus, um, who has been involved in the arts for decades, um, is trained as a frame conservator, and who, with her late husband Jan, formed the Bacus collection itself. In addition to admiring her deep love for Dutch art, I've always enjoyed her bright personality and keen intelligence, and I expect you will too um, as we begin our conversation together. Welcome, Marianne. Thank you, William. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a real oh, honor to be here. 
Well, we're, we're very <laughs> glad that you are uh, able to join us today. Um, and one of the things that I was uh, hoping to chat about um, is uh, in the video, I only gave rather a brief view of Jan and the collection you built together. Um, I remember him as jovial, direct, enthusiastic about art. Um, and I'm often reminded of his personality when I look at these paintings. I wonder if you might want to expand on what I've already said about the formation of the collection um, and how you worked together on it for so many years. It was a labor of love between the two of us. We both admired Dutch art and everybody thinks about the 17th century. We visited Holland frequently because Jan was Dutch and were introduced to the, to the 19th century by many of the dealers. Uh, <clears throat> what impressed us the most or was this visceral response that we had to the 19th century. It was secular, it was nonviolent, and it represented the beauty of everyday life. And we were just absolutely drawn into it. Another reason we started collecting it is because it was affordable. It was available. There was a plethora of art at the time, which was in the early, uh, about the early 90s. We were fortunate enough to meet people who were knowledgeable. And this is what led us into being thinking more of it as a collection rather than just buying haphazardly. <laughs> yes, well, it's uh, building those relationships over time, you know, mm -hmm. with dealers, auction houses, mm -hmm. um, things like that. That's really, you know, so much a part of collecting for museums as well as, um, as uh, people like yourselves. Um, and I was actually wondering also, um, how has building the collection expanded your view of the Netherlands and its culture? Um, you were talking about being drawn to the paintings and you know, mm -hmm. certain elements about them. Um, are, the, are there cultural uh, things as well um, that sort of came up for you um, in the process of building the collection? We found that everyone we came in contact were, they were open, they were gregarious, they spoke several languages. We never ever felt unsafe in the Netherlands. And we would just rent a car, we drove from one end to the other end, stopping at every antique shop, every small museum, every dealer. And people were so free with sharing their knowledge and giving us hints as what we should look for because they they could pretty much tell we were still novices at when we started uh, <clears throat> we would look at it two different ways jan did the research and i sort of looked at frames we did it from uh taking two sides together with different perspectives i had more of a gut reaction to paintings Jan had a very logical approach to paintings. Mm, mm -hmm. And As... <laughs> yes, and being Dutch, that was a big factor. Uh, <clears throat> but we decided early on that we would only buy art that we both agreed on. Mm. It wasn't going to be, he liked this one, I liked that one. We were, we spent tons of time together, but going to the auctions, and that is a whole life of its own. The information that you can gather, the, the protocol that occurs during an auction. And once they become, they begin to know you a little bit, they are great observers mm, of, uh -huh. of people who attend auctions. And they, they kind of figure out what you're interested in, so on and so forth. But they're also more than willing to help you. You would go, if you go to exhibitions before auctions, they'll take paintings off of the wall. They'll show you the backs, which is important. They'll talk to you about the frames and the condition. And so it's an invaluable thing mm, when, when you're trying to collect or improve your art collection. 
we did buy <clears throat> some terrible stuff, <laughs> which we no longer have. <laughs> and a man that we met on the way home from one of our first excursions into an auction, the sign outside his shop said, 19th century Dutch art, cheap. <laughs> and of course, Jan immediately walked in and said, I got to look here. <laughs> the man was closed, but he said, no, 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 come on in. He said, but come upstairs. And he asked us what we were doing. And he said, don't buy any of that stuff downstairs. That's reproduction Chinese. And we found out that the Chinese had flooded the market mm. early on with 19th century Dutch art. And so that made us aware of you had to do your research and you had to really look at what you wanted to buy. Otherwise, you didn't get quality. Right. Yeah. Well, um, I know you began the collection um, several decades ago um, mm -hmm. and the markets changed over time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's reflecting the growing importance of Dutch 19th century mm -hmm. painting. Um, and so um, what, what was your experience in the art market and, you know, how has it changed um, in recent years? In the beginning, <clears throat> um, prices were good. It was plentiful. Mm -hmm. It still was an unknown commodity in many mm -hmm. circles. Mm -hmm. Many people in the United States had absolutely no concept of what 19th century Dutch art was. Everybody relates to the 17th century. Right. And, but as time went on, it, dealers started to acquire more. Uh, better pieces came into the auction sites. Mm. And I think if you, uh, I don't know about today's market because mm. once Jan passed, that sort of ended this mm. book in my life because it was something that we did together. Right. And it yep. was never the same again. <laughs> yes, I can imagine it. Mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't be. Yeah, it, I was, uh, you know, I was asking about that because I actually, you know, there have been um, exhibitions. There was an exhibition of uh, Willem Bastian Tolan that mm -hmm. was two years ago at the Fondation mm -hmm. Studio in Paris. Um, there has been a major presence of Dutch 19th century art at um, the Maastricht Art Fair. Um, and yes. so, yes. you know, it's mm -hmm. really become um, very much uh, sought after in some of the same ways that it may have been sought after 150 years ago. Um, so I was just, you know, sort of curious about that. Mm -hmm. um, and how did you work out your goals for the collection? Um, was it based on opportunity? Did you have specific artists or specific subjects um, that you? Opportunity created? was a big part of it. Mm -hmm. But there was a commitment to research, which Jan did for hours and hours and hours online. He mm -hmm. kept contact with some of the dealers in the Netherlands. And it was a commitment to go and look and even if we didn't buy anything at a particular auction, you uh, we went just to see what was going on in the area. And again, people, uh, one of the, the biggest dealers, the finest dealers in the Netherlands, when we visited his gallery, he was very free with all the information. He'd say, don't look at that. Try this. Look at this. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was absolutely invaluable for us. And because Jan spoke Dutch. Right. When, <clears throat> when he would sit with the, the dealers finally invited him to sit with them in the first two rows at the, at the auctions. They didn't invite me, but they did invite <laughs> him. And so <clears throat> he, they would communicate among each other. And I can't tell you how valuable that experience was for him. Had he not been able to speak Dutch, he would mm. not have been able to pick it up. He could pick up what major buyers and dealers were saying at the uh, exhibitions of the paintings prior to that. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. It was a very kind of a, it was perfect. I mean, it was a fit that we both just melted into. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, and um, over time, um, uh, you sort of trained as a frame conservator. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think mm -hmm. people might be interested in hearing a, a bit about that as well. Well, I started out as a necessity uh, because when you buy art in, in Europe and you live in the States, then it means you buy the art, the art has to be shipped, then it has to come to wherever you are. And frequently it needs restoration, it needs cleaning. I was just fascinated by the frames. And frequently I would really push to buy a painting because I loved the frame. <laughs> and so the painting would be discarded and we kept the frame. <clears throat> it was very hard initially uh, I did not have an art background, but I had a good eye for color, and I've always worked with my hands. With research, I took classes that Hubert Baya taught at uh, the Campbell Center in Illinois for several mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. and that was just such a lucky, lucky thing for me. Also, the frame industry does a series of classes every year on the West Coast and the East Coast, where they have about two weeks of classes. So I tried to do as much of that as I could. Finding somebody in the area that was relatively close mm. was really difficult. And when we did try a few people that were, were recommended, we didn't really like what we got when it ah. came back. Right. Yeah. And so <clears throat> we felt you know, that I should do the best that I could. And I only really basically worked on our own art. I tried to use original materials that I learned about from Hubert's classes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a terrible builder. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> well, I, can yeah. do, I can do everything up to that part. Mm -hmm. And then when mm -hmm. it comes to that part, didn't well, it's, it's very, yeah, I, it's, it's a, it's a knack, I think. It's a knack. Mm -hmm. I think it really is. Yeah. Um, and um, just so people know, um, Hubert is, Hubert Baia is a specialist frame conservator mm -hmm. um, in the, and uh, lives in the Netherlands now, mm -hmm. uh, but had a presence in the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. Um and so the last question um, is sort of, you know, do you have a favorite or a favorite area among the paintings in the collection? Um, for me, I'm taken with the Skullfout River view in the show, mm -hmm. for example, especially. Um, but there, it must be like sort of trying to choose the favorite among your children. But, you know, um, you know, I think it's a, sort of an interesting thing to think about at least. I don't have a favorite. They're all my children. Mm, mm -hmm. That's the way I look at it. Uh, <clears throat> a man who helps me hang art, uh, when we're unpacking, every piece I pull out, I go, oh my God, I love this piece. The next piece comes out and it's, oh my God, I've missed this artist. I love this. He said, what don't you love? <laughs> and it's very, very hard. Although I do have some pieces stick out. Yosef Israel's. Mm, I love mm -hmm. his work. Um, I love the works that that feature cattle. I was raised on a dairy farm. Mm, so mm -hmm. this this is like home to me. Um, <clears throat> so we lived with the art. It was hung all over our house. Our grandchildren mm. grew up looking at this art and asking questions about it. We <laughs> We hung art salon style because we had so much. Mm, mm -hmm. So it's just became part of who we were. And when it's gone, we miss it. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, we do. <laughs> well, I always enjoy talking to you, Marianne. Thank you. Um, and, and I'm delighted that we've had the chance to do so today. Um, I hope we'll be able to do that in person soon. Uh, soon. Every... I hope so. Yes. yes. <laughs> Um, and I'm so grateful to you for taking the time to join us for this conversation. Um, in a moment, we'll take a closer look at some of the paintings in the exhibition. Um, 
both by Dutch Romantics and by Hague School artists, so you can get an idea of the variety of artists and styles in the show. Many of the paintings reflect the unique history of the Netherlands and its changing culture, and the network of artists involved here has some unusual aspects as well. Um, so I'll be answering questions at the end, uh, so those can be sent to Chelsea through the chat function. So let's look at the first slide. Um, and just so you'll know, this is the painting that I mentioned uh, that I was so taken with, uh, take, uh, mentioned to Marianne. Um, it is by Andreas Schelfhout, who is probably the best known of the Dutch romantics um, outside the Netherlands. Um, and he's certainly a pivotal artist uh, because he trained a generation, an entire generation of uh, painters. Um, and some of those uh, later became Hague School artists. Um, so the scene illustrates several things about Dutch Romanticism um, that you know, we had a sort of little introduction to, to in the video. Um, the first one is um, the absence of the artist, artist's hand. Um, so really the idea here is that the you're looking not at the surface of the canvas, but through it to this scene. So the um, and to achieve that, uh, there's very high craft and finish, um, meticulous brushwork, smooth pictorial surface, etc. Um, the second thing, and I think that it, I like to think that it's rather um, effective here, um, is the intentional emotional effect on the viewer. Here, it's sort of an attractive countryside sort of comfort. Um, and so what we see is um, a house uh, that's sort of nestled in under uh, a cliff, um, a chapel, roadside chapel over to the right uh, from it, um, and then there's a couple, it's difficult, it may be difficult to see on your screen, but there's a couple who's chatting in front of the chapel. Um, then there's the sweep of the river uh, with the landing where a man on horseback and other people are dealing with some goods from a boat. But then you go further back into the landscape um, and it's all suffused with this sort of evening glow that sort of, you know, enhances this um, very peaceful effect. Um, the third thing uh, here, of course, I mentioned in the, uh, in the video is lack of fidelity to nature. That is, this artist isn't painting what's directly in front of him. If you think about the Netherlands, there aren't really that many places that have this kind of rugged view. Um, and the only place that I can think of that really might is Limburg in the south, the province of Limburg. Um, but more likely this whole landscape is imagined. And one sort of clue to that is how neatly the land masses overlap on your way back into this sort of glowing background. So, so this is a sort of, you know, uh, look at, it's sort of to remind us some of the things that we learned about Dutch Romanticism um, and has to do with the country. But if we uh, go to the uh, city next, then we have a different view uh, that sort of shows some of the same ideas. This one, um, of course, uh, went past in the video a little bit. Um, so you, you've seen a few details from this painting. Um, and here, you have a town with very interesting different types of buildings, um, some with stepped roofs, um, and then there, uh, then there's a Baroque tower in the background, 17th century, um, and then you have the foreground where there uh, there is a sort of canal side road with a uh, horse and sledge uh, and a family uh, there. And then the canal itself uh, with a boat uh, that is on it. Um, and that boat is actually frozen in the ice. You can see people down uh, to the right of the boat. Um, and they're actually uh, 
uh, standing and one of them's actually skating on the ice. Um, so, of course, canals are a sort of a, an integral part of Dutch towns, many of them. Um, but even when they were frozen over, they were used for goods transport. So, um, so they are uh, unloading actually onto a sledge for the ice uh, from the boat. Um, and then they will uh, take those goods to the warehouse um, or market, et cetera. Um, and in the winter, all sorts of things move out onto the ice on these frozen canals. Um, and so at the on the right, there there's people that have set up a little tent uh, and they're flying the Dutch tricolor to attract attention. Um, and they're selling something, whether that's pancakes, I don't know uh, exactly what it is. It's not clear. Um, in the painting, um, but just to sort of uh, sort of emphasize that all sorts of things um, happen out on the ice in the winter in the Netherlands. Um, then uh, the composition here is really very intentional. Um, you'll notice that you have the Baroque tower, the mast of the ship, and then a tower further back that all line up to create this strong diagonal. Um, and that, which really sort of serves to uh, bring your eye further into the painting. Then also about halfway back, there is a uh, house facade that is in the sun. Um, and that's very intentional as well. It gives the eye a sort of place to rest on its journey back into the painting. So. All of these things are very intentional, um, and they're, uh, as I've said, they're sort of devoted towards a specific um, effect. But here we have also um, the sea uh, uh, aspect of the exhibition, um, and marine painting developed, it had developed as a subject in the 17th century. Um, and it continued to be very important in the 19th, um, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, the country is, uh, at that time, dependent on commerce and shipping for its prosperity. Fishing is important. Um, these are things that, of course, are uh, in addition to agriculture. Um, and interestingly, artists studied boats, ships, rigging, all of those things, different types of watercraft, they also studied the various kinds of sea, uh, choppy, smooth sailing, stormy, um, because, or, or certainly in part because, the people who bought these paintings were often merchants themselves, so they would have known how these things should appear. Um, this artist is Ari Pleissier, um, who was mostly self-taught, um, but eventually attained a high esteem among his fellow artists. Um, he pretty much specialized in seascapes and riverside scenes. Um, and this tendency towards specialization, it's one of the parts of the art world that the 19th century Dutch artists modeled on their 17th century predecessors. Golden Age artists were most often still life painters or landscapists or portraitists, um, and they didn't stray much outside their specific area. Um, at that time, that being the 17th century, um, it was partly because of the structure of the guild system. But in the 19th century, the Dutch Romantics specialized uh, for different reasons. And they specialized to the point that one of the artists in the show, Eugène uh, Verboekhoven, um, he was an animal painter and often landscapists would call on him to paint the animals um, in their uh, landscape scenes. So this painting, the focus is on the uh, human drama of shipwreck. Um, there's a rescue boat uh, that's coming in from the right for the few people clinging uh, to a ship that's foundered on the rocks. Um, so just to be clear, on the left-hand side, that gray mass uh, sort of uh, that looks almost like a wave is actually rocks um, that this ship has, uh, as I said, foundered on. So um, they are having 
a certain amount of difficulty to get to the ship because of the uh, of the uh, sea um, and the uh, very high waves. Um, and then at the right, uh, in the background, is a second ship. Um, it's seeming to ride the waves well, um, but in addition to the storm it left that uh, helped to founder the ship uh, on the rocks, there's a second storm, very dark cloud over at the right that this ship is sailing right into. So there's more drama uh, that awaits there. So these are some of the things in the uh, Dutch Romantic uh, part of the exhibition. So let's go and look at the Hague School. Um, so this scene is by Arnold Mark Horter, um, who is a member of the second generation of Hague School artists. So they were active in the uh, late 19th century and into the early 20th. Um, and it shows a lot of the characteristics of the school that I talked about in the video. Um, tactile brushwork, that is, this paint is a substance that's lying on top of the can canvas. Um, so you're actually looking at the paint um, in a, uh, in a, instead of looking through the paint uh, into something else um, in a certain way. Um, and just to sort of illustrate that better, in this painting, um, each of the apple blossoms at right is a separate blob of paint that's lying on top of the canvas. Um, and the same is true of, well, with a slightly, uh, with a rather drier brush, um, these green leaves coming out on the trees at left. Um, there, uh, the second characteristic that I mentioned was realism um, uh, and depicting what's in front of the artist. I talked, uh, talked about um, cropping and photography and how that may have influenced um, some of the sort of almost a viewfinder idea of, um, of composing a picture. Um, and so you see that here with the rest of this building at right, uh, which is may well be a barn, but could also be a uh, dwelling house. Um, the rest of it is implied outside the picture frame. And the same is uh, true of the, uh, there's a tree at left that is almost um, half cut off. So this kind of cropping, um, this kind of sort of looking directly at a uh, specific scene um, in a certain way. Um, and then the I mentioned the tonal palette, which is not quite as evident here. It will be um, in other slides. Um, and that's here because of the nature of the springtime scene. So Hague School artists, as I've said, tended to use middle tones, often grayish and brownish. Um, and so here, uh, because it's spring, um, the greens are a little bit more punched up, um, but you don't really have the absolutely brilliant green of the first flush of spring um, that we're uh, sort of beginning to get in Sacramento right now. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we'll see a different use of color. This is more typical um, of the Hague School use of color. Uh, the paintings by Jakob Maris, who is one of three brothers, uh, the others were Willem and Matthijs, who were all artists of the Hague School. Um, there was, uh, and so um, he worked with bold brushwork, um, and you see that especially here, if you're able to see the painting in person, the clouds really stand up almost, uh, you know, between an eighth and a quarter inch off of uh, the canvas. Um, and the, rest of the painting besides the sky um, is done in these sort of browns and grays, which of course is perhaps uh, partly because of the subject, it's a city scene, but if you compare it to the Dutch romantic city scene, you can see how very different um, the uh, idea is. Um, each of the windows uh, in these buildings is made of just simply one or two brush strokes of gray, black, um, gray or black, or uh, in some cases brown. Um, and so that's a very physical use of the paint. 
Um, and the opposite is true here um, in the reflections in the water. They're done with an almost dry brush, which allows the sort of to create, that allows the artist to create a sort of illusion of the surface of this canal. So this painting actually brings up another aspect of Dutch life that's worth explaining in a little bit more detail. Um, and that is this network of canals that connects the countryside to the cities um, and the cities to the major ports. So even uh, fields, uh, agricultural fields in the country, um, they're bordered by canals, which uh, make it possible to bring su supplies in um, and uh, product produce um, out uh, to market. Um, and then in the towns um, and cities, they make transport of goods and, and uh, transport of goods much uh, more simpler. Uh, much more simple. So those of you who have been to Amsterdam know that the houses, um, the grandest houses often face the canals or often have a canal facade and a street facade. Um, and they're uh, so much a part of the fabric of the towns, these canals, that people sort of live in houseboats in the middle of the city even today. Um, when I was talking about houses, um, the houses in Dutch towns, many of them, merchants' houses, are actually very uh, are unique in some ways. Um, and you see that in this painting. Uh, the two houses on the left have a beam that projects from the top of the facade, um, and there's something hanging from it. Um, these houses are actually both dwelling houses, that is on the lower level, and warehouses on the upper levels. Um, and so these beams uh, have a pulley that allows you to attach a rope to it and then hoist goods from your cart or boat, depending on whether you're uh, whether it's facing the the um, canal or the uh, street. Um, up into these uh, into the warehouse levels. So it's interesting that we see that here. So it's actually a very busy scene of commerce, um, just uh, just like a sort of modern city, except with boats instead of trucks. Um, and of course, as I've said, the canals connect the larger cities to the nearest uh, deep port um, for as export and import. So the last slide um, is our Hague School um, C scene. And there is each of the, I've chosen representative works from each of these sections, but the sections are much larger and have more variety in them than I'm able to sort of bring to you in such a short session. Um, this is by Hendrik Willem Meisdach. Um, he's one of the most famous artists of the Hague School. Um, and he focused almost exclusively on sea and shore scenes. Um, so he won a gold medal in 1870 at the Paris Salon um, and settled in uh, The Hague um, and studied the life of a specific beach town that's now a suburb of The Hague, um, Scheveningen. Um, and uh, so you can tell that here because the sale has the letters SCH on it. So that's the port of registry. Um, Scheveningen is a beach town, um, but it was also a place for commerce, um, for fishing. And that's what's happening here. Um, the, days, the boat with the day's catch has come in um, and the goods are being unloaded. This is an unusual type of boat that was developed over the centuries in the Netherlands. Um, float, uh, boats with rather flat bottoms were developed so that they could be beached easily because and goods unloaded at any point along the uh, shoreline um, so that people were not dependent on ports. So, um, so the uh, boat could be just dragged right up on the beach um, by 
uh, horses, and then, um, as I've said, goods unloaded. And so that's what's happening here. Um, the, you have a cart at the left um, that is uh, there waiting for some of the day's catch, which is being uh, distributed. There's men, women, um, other people um, here. Um, and there's several uh, paintings in the exhibition that include this kind of boat that's beached for the same purpose. So it's worth knowing about in a country that has such a uh, long gradual coastline and few deeper ports, it's actually really important uh, to be able to do this. Um, so those of you who have been to The Hague may already know Maystock's name uh, because in the 1880s, he, he painted an entire series of canvases that join uh, to create a panorama of Scheveningen in the 1880s. Um, and so that series of canvases sort of envelops the viewer. There's a viewing platform in the middle, and then there's uh, sand with seaweed and, um, and uh, starfish and uh, driftwood, all those sorts of things to sort of um, enhance this uh, impression. And it's still um, open today um, as the Panorama Mace Dock. Um, it's a museum. So um, at this point, um, it would be, I think, a nice time to open up for questions. Um, and, I'd, and I'd love to, um, I think I see Chelsea is appearing and Marianne is appearing um, yes. so that we can um, chat a little bit more. Yes, thank you, William, for giving oh. us a closer look at the exhibition and Marianne for sharing your own collecting experiences. Um, we actually have our very first question from one of our attendees is towards Marianne, um, kind of expanding on your collecting strategy. You kind of talked about it being based on opportunity and you and Jan both had to agree and like it, but someone is curious if you were attempting to create kind of an encyclopedic collection, examples of every major artist or did you really just focus on what appealed to you? To some extent, we did that. But the, the bigger factor is what appealed to us. But we did pay attention to the fact that we wanted to have at least one piece of a major artist of the area. Uh, and again, opportunity was a big factor. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you said your these artworks are like your children and are very special to you. And so I'm curious how you and Jan decided on the Crocker as the home for this beautiful collection. That's a really good question because it was serendipitous. We had so quite a few small exhibits in the East Bay area. And the curators of these small museums and the directors uh, would often say, what are you going to do with this? And mm -hmm. we'd say, well, you know, in the future, we would like to have a home because we were worried about what was going to happen to the art when we were gone. And we didn't want it to hit the auction block. We never sold anything and never had any intention of selling anything. Um, so we were regular attendees of a speaker series that took place in Oakland at the old theater downtown which was just a beautiful, elegant place to go. And so one of the programs that season was the Big Four of California. Hopkins, uh, Huntington, uh, Stanford, and of course, Crocker. And so they spent about 20 minutes on each man and their families and then what they did with their wealth. And we were just intrigued by what the Crockers did. Within a, probably a week, we took our first trip up to the Crocker Museum. Oh, I love and, that. Yeah. And it was absolutely, we were just mesmerized by the original museum. And mm -hmm. we thought, if you were ever able to do that, that's what we would like to do. Of course, they did it on a much grander scale than we did. Uh, we had several trips to where we just went in, we didn't meet with anyone, we just went in as, as tourists. And then when we finally decided, 
let's approach him. We were we were nervous because we didn't know whether we really had the quality that a museum would want. Many people think you just walk up to a museum and say, hey, I have all this stuff and I'm going to give it to you. And they say, no, thank you. <laughs> Uh, you know, this is well, we certainly didn't do that. No, definitely not. <laughs> I know. But we met with William the first time, and William, I have to tell you, I we were so grateful because he listened to us, he helped us, he advised us, and he was instrumental in this whole process and has been in selecting the pieces that he has come to the house to pick out. Uh, so the, the talk on the Crockers was definitely inspiration. Plus I have right here, and I looked it back up because the one thing we did when we visited other museums is we always looked at their mission statement. Mm. Mm -hmm. And here it is. Oh, there it is. <laughs> this, this is in our file. Oh, <laughs> when we developed our mission statement, it's not exactly the same, but it represents a lot of the same thoughts about a permanent base to conserve this wonderful, wonderful art for the future, for kids to go see, for anyone. And we have never underestimated estimated, estimated the value of having a museum in the community. Well, I appreciate that so much. And we appreciate this beautiful gift and collection. And um, it is really changing the museum's collection and, and being able to share this with everyone in the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And okay. mm -hmm. to follow up, I'm curious, how does this gift really fit into the Crocker's European collection? Well, you know, the Crocker's European collection um, is sort of, uh, determined in some ways by the founders' uh, collection, which, of course, the many of the strengths are well known. Um, we uh, 17th century Dutch is something that uh, that were, you know, that the Crockers sort of uh, began. Um, then 17th and 18th century Italian and French, um, which is sort of less numerous, but also very. I'm important, but there's actually a very large um, collection of 19th century uh, German and Austrian painting. What the Crockers were buying was, of course, European contemporary art at the time. Um, and so we, uh, the Central European Gallery um, in the 1872 building is sort of we're one of three institutions in the United States that sort of focus has a major focus on 19th century German and Austrian. The other two being the Fry in Seattle, which uh, has later things in the century, and then Milwaukee, which has actually different subjects um, and earlier uh, material. So those two strengths, the uh, German and Austrian 19th century and the Dutch 17th century, it may, it meant that um, 19th century Dutch actually illuminates both of those areas in addition to being um, important in itself. So these, uh, so the two areas, you know, the, the uh, collection actually fits the Crocker really, really well in terms of um, of how the rest of the European collection um, came about, um, and also the, you know these uh, relationships, and as I say, um, it's a major uh, focus. Um, and with the recent wonderful uh, gift, um, will sort of uh, continue to be a major focus for the institution. Um, and many of you have seen in our galleries um, the Bacus Foundation Gallery, um, which has been there since our uh, building opened in the among the European galleries. Mm -hmm. William, I just got an interesting question here from um, one of our attendees, John. He's asking if there are any schools of painting today that are kind of similar to this style. 
Hmm, that is a really good question and one that I'm sort of only moderately equipped to answer. Um, and I think part of the reason that I'm all uh, moderately equipped to answer it is, you know, not only uh, are we talking about contemporary art, which is um, an area that, you know, I have a continuing interest in, but don't have an, an encyclopedic knowledge of, but also it's difficult to talk about schools of painting in the 21st century in the same way as you could in the 19th. Mm -hmm. um, I, there are people in the Netherlands who work in a, uh, in a very uh, similar style that have know their sort of art history and incorporate elements um, from the Hague School into their art, especially as uh, the Hague School has become more important over the past 20, 30 years. Um, I can't actually give you um, specific names um, at the moment, but there are, you know, there are people who do. Um, I think that um, there are sort of similar parallels in a funny way um, in the art of the Western United States in that there are people who um, in the 20th century and even now in the 21st work in a similar realistic way um, okay. with a tonal mm -hmm. palette. Mm -hmm. You know, there are elements that, um, you know, that certain people, you know, they're parallels, not necessarily direct influences, but parallels with the Hague School. And then of course, in the Western United States, there are people who are, you know, interested in, um, a very highly finished, um, romantic, in quotes, uh, view of the West and still paint in a similar style. So there are, you know, sort of parallels I can draw, um, mm -hmm. but I don't know that I can really sort of talk about specific school. Okay. I'm curious, William, um, when you look at the organization of the show, we have the Dutch Romantics, we have the Hague School, we have Country, City and Sea, how did this organization really affect the visual design of the exhibition space? Well, you know, it's interesting because the uh, this is one of those shows for the for the title tells you basically what you're going to see. Mm -hmm. um, in that we start with Dutch Romantics Country section, Dutch mm -hmm. Romantics City section, Dutch Romantics Sea section. Uh, well, that isn't maybe the best way to put that. The section that includes sea paintings in the Dutch uh, Romantic um, uh, area, then the same thing for the Hague School. So mm -hmm. um, that organization sort of determines certain things. Um, one is the um, color of the walls. Um, if you think about it, if you have a large number of paintings that have a lot of sky in them, that is the sea or, you know, even the city uh, in some cases, but the country, um, you really can't do anything that's terribly light or terribly blue because the paintings are going to sort of, you know, it's not going to do the paintings any favors. Let's just put it that way. So um, I th as you saw um, in the background uh, with Lyle, then, um, we're going with a dark green, um, and that's because of the uh, because of the subjects, and also the tonalism responds well to that as well. So, the contrast between the Hague School and the Dutch Romantics, there's two elements there that sort of you know create uh, that determine. Uh, one of them is color, and I've already talked about that. The other is size. Um, as time went on, um, and when uh, we go into the Hague School, canvases start to get bigger and bigger, mm -hmm. um, and so you'll you'll notice a significant difference in sort of size of canvas, and therefore the size of section in the exhibition. So mm -hmm. um, a sort of greater. Uh, greater amount of wall space to a smaller number of paintings in that section. Um, and I hope, and I'd like to think that it sort of works. Um, and I hope that we'll have the chance to um, show the public um, and they can judge and, you know, whether it works or not um, when we're all able to get back in the building finally, whenever that is. <laughs> <laughs> 
hopefully soon. Um, William, I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit more about the Dutch artistic community during this period. Well, you know, the artistic community in the Netherlands, um, starting in the Dutch Romantic period, was focused in the major sort of centers. Um, and the uh, most active artists club, uh, clubs, I should say, or artists associations, mm -hmm. were in the political capital, that is The Hague, and the economic capital, which is Amsterdam. Amsterdam. Um, and that has been true since that time. Um, the Hague School, those artists were actually not necessarily part of the Hague School Art Association to begin with, but they became part of it. Um, what happened um, is similar in some ways to what happened in France, um, but in a different scale and in specifically Dutch ways, which is artists created networks um, with, uh, you know, among themselves. The Hague School artists, in the video I say that you can't really say that they imported the Barbizon School to the Netherlands. It's true because once those artists returned to the Netherlands, they looked to each other for influence. Um, and so they were sort of, they had borrowed some things, but they were very much part of the Dutch scene. And so that sort of expands um, as time goes on. Great. I think we have time for one more question. And so I have a question for both of you and I'll start with Mary Ann. Which do you prefer, Dutch Romantics or the Hague paintings? Tough decision. Tough decision. Um, probably the Hague, the Hague paintings. Really? Because I was beginning to lean more towards uh, the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Okay. And part of it was because women were not allowed to paint or sell art. And I was always, being a feminist, I've always was curious as to why there weren't more women in the field. And so to, at the end of our collection, we, I started getting a few pieces that were painted by women. But they were, they, uh, there were a few that were earlier, but, but that's where I was kind of leaning. Yes, and several of them um, actually have come to us mm -hmm. thanks to you. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So we're really uh, glad to be able to sort of mm -hmm. include that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. William, what about you? Dutch Romantics or Hague School? It depends on my mood. Oh. Um, <laughs> yes, good point. Good. Point. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, in the winter, I sort of lean towards the Hague School because that tonal palette sort of fits the, my experience of Sacramento in the winter. winter. Um, those mm -hmm. sort of foggy days that sort of stretch on. Um, and I actually um, find that kind of weather a little, you know, sort of comforting. Um, when I lived uh, in the Bay Area briefly, you know, briefly many mm -hmm. years ago, I actually lived in a foggy neighborhood specifically because, you know, I find it very sort of calming. Mm -hmm. um, and I find the same thing in some of the Hague School paintings. Um, some of them, of course, can be very dramatic, like the Israels. Um, but, um, and other, other moods, um, I'm really intrigued by the Dutch Romantics and how they sort of compose things and sort of, you know, picking out which, you know, which way that they have sort of created this, you know, sort of picking apart that sort of manipulation of elements with, you know, how the eye is led various ways. You know, it's very much a sort of exercise for me uh, to sort of figure some of those things out. So, as I say, sort of, it depends partly on mood. So wonderful. I'm so excited to be able to hopefully open soon so all of our members can come and decide for themselves if they prefer the Dutch Romantics and Hague School paintings. But I do want to thank both of you, William and Marianne, for joining us this afternoon and getting a close look at the exhibition. It's been lovely. Thank you very much. Well, it's so so delightful to uh 
to be here and to also have the chance to talk to Marianne. So that's, yeah. that's such a pleasure. And if, I, if, Jan, if Jan were still here and, you know, I, I feel that this is sort of a living memorial to his memory. And one of his wishes when he passed very quietly at home uh, and he never wanted anything done when he passed. Mm -hmm. He said, life is over. Just let it go. But this is a living memory for him. And he would be extremely happy to know that we've been able to create a home. I wanted to add one thing about the Hague painters. The people that we worked with, they referred to them as the painters of mud. <laughs> oh, because of course. Because that was what the environment was at certain times. And when mm -hmm. you look at the, the paintings, you can kind of see why. Mm -hmm. But it was a very common phrase that they used. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's been well, wonderful. Thanks. Thank you both. Thank, thank you, thank so you much. again. And I also want to thank all of our members at home, not just for joining us today, um, but for your continued support of the Crocker Art Museum. With your support, the Crocker is able to bring people together and connect them in unexpected ways with art, ideas, each other, and the world around them. And for that, I thank you. I want to remind you that the full exhibition video is available. The link will be posted here in the chat. And I look forward to seeing you back in the gallery soon when we are able to reopen. So until then, have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you next time. Thank you.